Liberia. And I got a chance to talk to one uh, woman who told me that the year before in 2007, there was a cholera outbreak in her community and she lost her husband and she lost her son within a course of two days. And these people had survived the war, but they could not survive the battle against cholera. The light in the story of this woman was that she became part of a team that was doing hygiene communication and helping other people. And so I could see how we could turn this story around. We know that there's still 2.5 billion people who do not have access to a proper place to call a toilet. And we also know that due to bad sanitation, countries such as Kenya lose $324 million every year. Water and sanitation is intricately linked with other social sectors. For girls, for example, if they're going to school and the school doesn't have good sanitation facilities, their attendance might go down. And for health, we know that water is a critical component in the preventive element. I was quite um, lucky to have had the opportunity to work with the Water and Sanitation Program of the World Bank. They were interested in knowing what was going on in Liberia and Niger, particularly with regards to this question of aid effectiveness. In both countries you could see that most of the financing goes towards delivering the actual services. But there is a bigger gap when it comes to financing that is targeting uh, capacity. Uh, various research have shown that uh, the water and sanitation sector specifically could be dependent on aid from anywhere between 25% to even 70%. Beyond the ownership question is the issue of alignment, which is basically whether donors do provide their financing according to what is agreed in the plan. And what we found in both countries is that uh, donors are not yet at the stage where they are able to do that, uh, actually because the government doesn't have the systems that the donors should align to. There should be a balance. While you're providing finances for services, for building latrines and boreholes, there should be some significant focus also on building capacity that will in the long run be able to raise financing, be able to actually improve revenue collection and be able to deliver uh, the services that are required. The health and education sectors, for example, have uh, gone ahead of the water and sanitation sector to develop their own standard mechanisms for measuring aid effectiveness. The, in the education sector, they had the Global Partnership for Education. In the health sector, they have the International Health Partnership. It was not until about uh, 2010 when um, the Sanitation and Water for All came up. Sanitation and Water for All is, in my view, one of the best things that have happened in the water and sanitation sector. It is a partnership of more than 90 uh, governments, uh, private sector, institutions, NGOs and donors that have come together to enhance delivery of services. But the main question of the research was what can these partners do to improve their delivery? Some are fragile post-conflict countries like Liberia, but also some are low-income countries that have been stable for some time. And you cannot pick one size for all of these. And therefore, the recommendation that we, we've made is that countries should look at key aspects of their delivery. So it could be on financing. Is their financing moving from being off budget, which means donors are giving money to the sector, but the government doesn't know. So if you're able to get financing onto the plan, the next target would be to get it onto the annual budget so that annually when the government announces its budget, it would be able to say, we anticipate from our development partners financing of so much that would go towards uh, water and sanitation. The MIDP program um, has been one of the best experiences that I can say I have gone through. When I was looking for, for a graduate course, I wanted something that could help me advance academically but also maintain the practical depth and I just look at the experience I've had also with interactions with um, other fellows and interactions with professors and the faculty. There's a lot of energy now, a lot of insights and obviously I will go into the field and find a lot of questions but I think that there's been some preparation here in terms of how to find the answers and even if I don't find the answers how to work with the other people in the network to actually try and find a solution.